Thanks, everyone. Uh, first of all, good morning. I'm still trying to wake up. I'm sure most of you guys are too. Uh, was uh, most of this crowd like we're at? Uh, what, what, who, who was at Web3? I was just curious. Wow, oh, that, that was a phenomenal event, right? Like I'm still trying to shake off, and uh, I actually submitted my slides very late because of the last minute knowledge I was just gaining, and I just had to submit it at one point because of all the discussions that were happening there. It was just so uh, uh, high caliber. So uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, protocol tokens. Uh, I know it, like we can see these things as two different constructs, right? Like protocols, not tokens, and tokens, not protocols. So uh, I just wanted to kind of like a lot of this talk, it's a very 10,000 foot view. Uh, a lot of this information uh, is collated from uh, my experience in the, uh, when I was living in New York. So just a quick background of, uh, uh, of me in general, uh, that I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Paperchain, as uh, Dimitri has uh, expressed. We're creating like a P2P marketplace around uh, 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 for music media companies, uh, how they can access their future cash flow. Uh, so I've uh, last about four, four or five months ago, I started a token engineering NYC community when I saw the Berlin community really popping. and. Uh, uh, we, 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 uh, I've been leading the workshop series there uh, and started to build a community and we actually uh, built a very strong uh, community there and there's a lot of uh, sharing knowledge and uh, uh, contribution. So a lot of the information that you will see here is a collation of uh, my observation being the organizer and they're kind of like working with the moderators and the panelists there, etc. Uh, so I primarily work at the intersection of uh, music, technology, and crypto. Uh, so a little another uh, background is that I grew up in India and I lived in the United States. Uh, my last corporate job was probably as an engineering manager at a uh, American company, and I pretty much called it quits uh, to move formally into music industry. Uh, and then I came to Europe, and I haven't gone back since uh, for a full time. Uh, but I, I discovered crypto by accident when I was looking at copyrights and something called unpaid and unclaimed royalties in the music industry. And uh, I have been uh, really deep down the rabbit hole, and uh, I've been exploring various different paradigms and applications that uh, crypto actually unlocks. Uh, lastly, I just uh, moved to Germany about like a month ago. I live in Frankfurt. Uh, uh, Given that I like music, tech, and crypto, I don't know why I'm do what I'm doing in Frankfurt, right? <laughs> so, uh, so without further ado, right? Uh, so we're gonna talk. Uh, just the overall agenda is that uh, we're gonna talk about protocols and tokens. Protocol tokens. Uh, a little. Uh, we're gonna touch upon uh, this very uh, infamous or pretty famous topic on FRAT protocol, the investment thesis, I guess and the adoption ch challenges that we have as an industry and the community, uh, and then what token models that we can use or where can we arrive to to kind of unlock the uh, uh, larger potential that underlies. So uh, this is pretty much the gist, right? Like four years ago, we would like pretty much, uh, when the, the, the app store was at the peak of this, you know, uh, we were like, yeah, we, you have an app for that. Pretty much anyone asking any question, the answer could have been like, you have an app for that. And we are arriving to that uh, conclusion this year where, you know, we, you have a token for that. And uh, when you see, uh, if you see last year as the, uh, uh, the year of ICOs where uh, capital raising uh, uh, initiatives have been uh, predominantly uh, taken over the last year. The, and this year is a year of build, I guess, right? Like uh, you are, uh, we're building a lot of those protocols and we're, uh, most of the ideas are starting to materialize. So uh, one of the things that uh, I observed uh, from last year is uh, uh, what were some, were, uh, some of the dichotomies last year are turning into spectrums. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is especially when you look at something like a token last year, the, most of the questions and discussions where are, are you a utility token? Are you a, a security token? But to, the, if you ask that same question today, you'll probably rephrase it as like, how utilitarian is your token? And the same thing with decentralization. It's not like a, a binary statement. Are you decentralized or not? But how decentralized are you? And where do you fall within that spectrum? And what properties that you uh, uh, that you uh, uh, implement, right? So, uh, so the main thing from here uh, that I take is that we as a community, we start to uh, uh, build a lot of knowledge and we create, have these conferences like Web3 and there's a lot of sharing knowledge and contribution, cross-contribution, and we're learning, we're figuring out these things as we go. And 
obviously, uh, way we are designing token systems are extremely difficult, and having a structured thesis or a structured uh, framework actually helps us actually uh, capture uh, ideas and then implement those and iterate on them, and that's uh, been the biggest challenge as a me, uh, where I work predominantly on protocol uh, architecture and token designs. <coughs> So uh, from the token engineering workshops in New York City, when we were discussing all these uh, uh, workshops, which end up being like three hours long and whiteboarding sessions, uh, these are the uh, main questions that we uh, we try to frame it around. Like, you know, the first thing is why why do you need a token for your the protocol that you design, and you know what what token models do we have in our arsenal that we can kind of start to leverage something that's existing, something that works, something that was verified. And what is a general architecture? So you have different agents, and if you have different uh, behaviors on the network, how do we create those incentives, right? And then how do we extract that desi desired behaviors? And then finally, like you know, what can you, uh, what kind of governance structures or security implementations that you can to kind of enforce some of those, uh, contain those uh, par parameters and behaviors? So uh, earlier this year, something that I worked on where we used this uh, uh, canvas quite a bit. Uh, this is like a work in progress pretty uh, early. But if you see, this is uh, something I call a protocol canvas. And you can see, you can find that on GitHub, uh, which is basically a mapping between uh, users, uh, the agents of the network, their role. And then you start capturing this, uh, uh, what value add? What's their role in the network? What incentives they, what they need to kind of derive, extract that behavior uh, from through the network? And what token that you can uh, uh, design, how, how you can design that token is a pretty much a byproduct of this ideation phase, right? Uh, so uh, we, an interesting thing in this uh, this practice was that as uh, you, you don't already know all the players of your network going to be, so as you add, you kind of uh, you, you start maintaining this document. It's very much like a lean business model canvas, but it's more uh, protocol token ideation phase kind of uh, centric. So uh, moving on to, uh, so this is uh, something I read earlier this year. Uh, now, I know this is an investment thesis, uh, but as an engineer by trade, I read it completely differently. And funnily enough, uh, when I moved to New York City, one of my uh, my roommate happens to be a VC in the crypto space, and we would our kitchen conversations would be around you know uh, <laughs> investment ideas versus engineering ideas for like lasted four months long. So uh, for for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the general thesis from an investment uh, perspective is that uh, uh, when you look at the Web 2.0. A lot of value that was captured was uh, actually in the applications layer, and then because applications are built on this really thin stack of protocols, uh, but it's actually uh, reverse uh, in blockchain world and crypto world, where uh, the protocol is a shared data layer, right? It's a shared incentive layer, the, so you don't have to build everything from scratch. It's already available there. So, so your application stack is a very thin layer we are going to build on top of. So, the value as an investment thesis was focused on uh, protocols. But again, this was probably three or four years old. We know of very few protocols back then. Probably Bitcoin was the predominantly uh, the, the major one. And we had lesser examples, probably, of how we can uh, tweak and grow and uh, uh, evolve those uh, paradigms, right? So uh, there was another interesting post by uh, Union Square Ventures, uh, how uh, these the movement we see in the internet is a cyclical phase, right? First came uh, it's a, it's it cycles between infrastructure and applications, and what that means is that we create apps, and then there's infrastructure that's being built, and then there's uh, there uh, this sprouts more apps, and that really results in other protocols to be uh, uh, envisioned and created. Uh, one of the uh, actual very interesting example is. Uh, Email, probably one of the most used applications that we use, it's, it came before the SMTP protocol. Uh, it it kind of makes us think, right? Like, why was a protocol developed after uh, an app was designed? Or how did the app was before the protocol? But the whole point of the protocol was that there were other apps. The, the, the design of the protocol was so that they can be apps built in a very uh, uh, quick way, and you can abstract a lot of that friction, but really capture the value of the underlying protocol. And we see the same thing in crypto. Uh, again, not my slide. Don't. There's a huge Twitter discussion on BTC being an app. 
don't quote me on this, uh, but <laughs> so we see the same pattern going in crypto, right? We have infrastructure elements being built, our protocols being built out, and then you see different new uh, new age of apps uh, sprouting from it. And we will be seeing this, uh, a lot of this. Now, kind of put that in context with what we saw earlier. Last year was year of ICOs, and this year was the year of protocols. And Perhaps the next year is uh, the year of dApps, and then you know you'll see more uh, protocols and more dApps, and the possibilities are going to get uh, unlocked a lot more. So uh, this, uh, uh, for those of you in engineering, I'm sure this is uh, quite familiar. This is a, uh, a very famous. Op uh, it's called the OSI model which uh, it's basically a blueprint of what internet, uh, the interoperability of uh, internet was built on, right? Uh, which is very interesting because you have these seven layers. Uh, the way it's designed is that every layer of the stack, uh, it captures a certain set of value but enables and unlocks uh, uh, another layer to be built on top while you can abstract away the, the complexities of that underlying protocol. So for example, uh, when you build something on the data link layer, you don't have to worry about uh, the physical layer. So when you're creating applications, you are abstracted away from all the concepts, or most of the concepts or most of the underlying things from the physical, like you don't care, as a application engineer, you don't care about uh, nodes, you know, you don't care about physical links between your data centers and that's because uh, uh, we uh, we have this model, and a lot of these technologies and businesses have built built uh, uh, stack focused. Or, and uh, I for a long time I actually thought uh, when we build the internet that we actually missed a layer called blockchain, right? Uh, but uh, I'm starting to see that it actually spreads across these uh, uh, as a medium, and it kind of sits in parallel with a very different uh, uh, mindset, I guess. So if we were to kind of like impose, superimpose, or kind of like see what the blockchain structure, very, again, a 10,000 foot view, very simplistically speaking, uh, we're probably gonna arrive at something like this. You know, you have this Ethereum or a low level blockchain, and you have a incentive tokenization layer, right? And then uh, a consensus layer, proof of something, uh, you know, and then you have protocols, a lot of these protocols that we've been seeing this year, which are on top. And then you have applications, APIs, oracles, marketplaces, and different kinds of users who interact with these dApps and services. So, where we are right now, the talk, uh, the talk is going to be focused on is that, that protocol layer where it sits between the low-level blockchain and the high-level dApps. So, so this, is, this is what we're looking at, right? Look, we have users, uh, and we have dApps, and we have a, a blockchain. And dApps are literally the means, their user interface for extracting that value from the blockchain or understanding or conveying. So we need that medium. And we see protocols built in here, right, between the dApps and blockchain. But uh, in reality, what we're seeing is that there's a whole bunch of uh, protocols, right? If you are, uh, if you create a dApp, uh, you have a user, and perhaps you're sending an email, and that email is a decentralized protocol. That's such a small function of your entire business. You have we, we as a dApp, or we when we are building businesses on uh, the dApps layer. Uh, you have marketing departments, you have customer experience, you have consumer experience, you have sales, you have a whole bunch of things, right? So these protocols are very uh, at the low level and uh, we are, then they unlock a lot of potential actually. And uh, these, uh, the, the value of the protocol is actually captured and relayed in the form of tokens. And each uh, protocol has their own token because it's a, a different way to capture that value and a different uh, way to uh, characterize it and then kind of relay it over. So what, in essence, we are seeing in this model is that when the users interact with the dApps and try to interact with the, they are trying to use the blockchain technology, that token uh, transcends, the friction of that token transcends across all the overlying dApp layers, pretty much. So really what we're seeing in here, when you actually see a large mainnet, mainnet dApp right now in the current situation, would be that a user would require a lot of tokens to interact with a dApp. So uh, as a uh, application developer and application architect, uh, so when, when you're building this uh, uh, a business around and you're creating uh, a lot of this customer experience, user experience components, uh, 
at the end of the day, if you want a, I don't see us actually any company or all the companies actually having a page for each token that uh, you, what the user would want to have to kind of like uh, explain them how to use that token. And if you want to have any user experience, this is, we don't, we are not the creators of token. You have to go there and ask kind of thing. I don't see that happening. But this, uh, what my question is that like here, we the this is this transaction happens because it's an ERC20 token. The, the beauty of the ERC20 token, if you look at the code, is that you're transferring from X to A. You're transferring value from X to A. The very nature of the ERC20 token is that disintermediation. So that is baked into the token. That's baked into the protocol that you are transferring value without any intermediary uh, steps. But uh, as a counter, as a paradox, dApps are required. Uh, where when you create a protocol, you need dApps to actually get at those network effects people talk about, and we need more user adoption. Then you know, you know, we need to grow as the industry. So, kind of diving deeper into that protocol stack is what we probably have here, right? Uh, we have this layer zero, what I call like it's only as something that's kind of more of a recent discovery, as things like lib P2P and you know that enable node and peer discovery. But the, you have layer one technologies that's like, that's like the blockchain zero, low trust platforms, and then then this you have layer two technologies like you have state channels, encrypted storage, plasma. And think of protocol extensible tooling, that's like your developer tools, uh, something that abstracts even further. Uh, you have Web3, Parity, a uh, whole bunch of technologies there, and then browsers. So browsers are our way to interact with the, uh, the dApps, right? We have so many different wallets, MetaMask, you have Status, uh, and then finally the dApps that enable uh, that stack, this entire stack. So it's no uh, secret that you will see the tokens being built in various different layers. But all of these tokens in various different layers having various different characteristics are expressed as a singular, uh, and they're expressed as only as a uh, ERC20 token. Because again, regardless of where you lie on this uh, layered stack, you are transferring value from entity X to entity Y in a decentralized, uh, disintermediation fashion. So you are, you are forcing that transfer of value without anything in between. So, uh, so, so we have this friction, we have this uh, adoption challenges, how do we get users on board? And uh, there's a uh, really nice article I couldn't find anymore. Uh, someone did a U UX study on how uh, the, the, the curve is for actually a uh, new user to come on and set up their uh, MetaMask and my the wallet and actually start interact interacting with the dApps. And you know, uh, most of the marketing techniques rely on a three click or 1.5 second attention span. And we are dealing with uh, like probably 15 step processes where it, which it requires a user jumping across the spectrum. Uh, and then, so how do we actually kind of like uh, minimize that, right? And so as a DAP, and now the mindset now here is to shift your mindset to probably as a DAP, you're setting up a business building on top of all these protocols that are uh, capturing this value uh, beautifully, right? Some of these examples that I'm gonna show around, I'm a huge fan of and I'm very familiar and I've uh, uh, had first-hand knowledge of working with them, discussing with them, and uh, uh, work, I've written some code on them. So, so the, the, there are four questions we wanna ask uh, when we look at these protocols, right? Uh, what does a protocol do? What can be built uh, on top of that stack? Uh, what business model uh, exists for the protocol and what business model uh, or options are available for anyone building on top of that protocol? Because these are the four critical things because if you're a protocol, your customer probably or your end user is probably a DAP or an organization who's gonna unlock and get, yours, uh, get the network effects. So zero X protocol, uh, I love the team. I absolutely love their uh, uh, stack, and I stole a lot of that code uh, for my exercises and the patterns and stuff. So, uh, so what does a protocol do, right? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar. Uh, you know, you can build uh, decentralized exchanges on top of it. Uh, you can transfer tokens uh, from entity to entity B, and you can now even trade these in NFTs, uh, uh, non fungible tokens. So uh, as a relayer, so relayers are businesses or relayers are dApps that you can build on top of uh, the zero X stack. So 
uh, drill layers are really the ones that are going out connecting the users and uh, bringing, and if you see the things like uh, radar relay, they have a whole bunch of uh, users. Uh, uh, but when you look at uh, what radar relays or any decks, in fact, uh, building on top of 0x, uh, the business model is that you can collect fees in 0x token, which, which is the utility of that token uh, right now. Uh, or you don't collect the fees at all. Or you can collect fees, I've learned this recently, in Ether itself. So you can collect, there are three ways. You can collect fees in Ether, you can collect fees in the 0x tokens, or not collect fees. So my, my analysis here is that when you're creating the DAP, you have your own characteristics. You are trying to create incentives and you're capturing those in your token as well. So not only, uh, so when you build on top of this protocol, when you, uh, you cannot actually impose fees on your own token. So that's one business model that you cannot implement. So a lot of relayers that I'm seeing actually are don't actually collect any token uh, or any fees. So how do they sustain themselves? Uh, the patterns that you will start seeing is that they've raised funds with uh, uh, dev grants. Uh, they've, uh, and a lot of these protocols, if you see, they have a request for call for startups page where they want people to, hey, uh, they want to help uh, ideas come up. Right, and then, uh, but the business model is what my uh, comes in. How do we sustain? I mean, this stuff is not free, right? We we put a lot of effort. How do we attract the biggest talent and still sustain us, uh, the development, sustain the business and ideas? Uh, so swap protocol. This is AirSwap, uh, very similar to Zero X, but not. Uh, they, uh, a lot of the trading that occurs also enables uh, exchanges, decentralized exchanges. Uh, the focus is on creating trading bots and uh, uh, larger institutions. And uh, uh, the inherent model is that there is no fees that you can uh, impose if you build on top of that, right? Uh, the only utility that I, uh, I was able to kind of extract of an air swap token is that you need a minimum a a AST uh, to issue orders that you want to put on a DEX. Right, so you have to have a hundred tokens to kind of put that. So, so what? Uh, so they themselves are building DApps, and the business models that they unlock for themselves probably is around uh, uh, building custom DApps and custom solutions for larger uh, solutions. So uh, another protocol, uh, Live Peer. This is Live Peer protocol. A huge fan of these guys. They have probably the most fun crypto economics baked into their token. Uh, they uh, basically it's very flexible uh, protocol and you can build a lot of things on top of it around uh, live streaming broadcasting uh, particularly transcoders and broadcasting right uh, the, the design is that it's, it involves uh, high uh, network participation and they're not on exchanges yet and they're looking at probabilistic uh, micropayments and stuff like that but still if you build on top of this protocol you are going to collect fees on this token and then finally, Dharma is something what Paper Chain is uh, exploring heavily to kind of build on top of. Uh, the, the, these guys have a, a framework where uh, you can build on top of their stack, but there is actually they have zero, they have no token. Uh, uh, and uh, you can collect fees in any ERC20 token, and you can collect fees in, uh, you can create issue uh, debt instruments representing any ERC721 tokens, which is extremely flexible for businesses to build on top of this because they can now impose their own token as, they, as a revenue stream, which is, uh, again, quite interesting. So how do they sustain themselves, right? How do they create a business model around uh, to survive and go forward? So they have a Red Hat, uh, a Linux kind of uh, model where they create a consultancy service. They want to create custom applications with the larger uh, institutions. And uh, so that's the, uh, the other stream that they're focusing on how they can build as a company. So the observation from all of this is that majority of protocols, their infrastructures, where there's a lot of code, a lot of uh, uh, low-level components, is that they're relying on market liquidity as a sole business model to kind of bring in and sustain themselves. Uh, but the question is that, can we do better? Uh, we are only tapping into the ERC-20, uh, the, the only available economy token that I see it. So uh, kind of putting all that, collating those thoughts, uh, is that what we need probably is a flexible, da uh, a flexible token model for DAP projects to abstract away all the underlying frictions uh, of the underlying protocols, but also at the same time capturing and relaying the value of the protocols. Therein lies our biggest challenge as a community, and therein lies our biggest challenge for the, uh, how to get users to come onto our uh, platforms. 
to kind of like summarize the whole thing, right? So capture value, uh, protocols value in token, or have no token, what we are kind of tr trying to see a lot of these uh, uh, apps building. Uh, relay the protocol's value for over the layers, transcend it, because sometimes governance and security and like all those have to be captured in value and it has to be to the end user. So you have to probably transcend some of those characteristics and properties across. Uh, promote network effects among dApps. How do we incentivize dApps to extract the value of your protocol so that they can sustain themselves, but not just having a developer grant? How do they create a business model? So ha having that flexibility is super important, right? Uh, so minimize friction for protocol token for dApps. And lastly is that uh, uh, we need that flexibility. Maybe even have a proxy wrap that token. And what we really need as a protocol designers is that we need businesses to build on top of it and have a flexible business model through the representation of that token. So perhaps, perhaps what we're looking at is what we saw this, where we have multiple tokens across the spectrum, needs to move to something like this, uh, where because the expectation when you come from that side of the user is that why am I required to use 20 tokens that I collected to interact with one dApp. That's the question that we want to minimize to. So how do we how do we even get there, right? That's been the mission that one of the things that I'm here jumping across uh, conferences. Conferences, I'm doing a lot of research and perhaps it's putting together an EIP proposal as the outcome of this. Uh, so the biggest question from all of this, is ERC20 token the right model when you're designing protocol? So uh, maybe what we're gonna look at some in the future is something like this. When I create my protocol token, extract the value of the ERC20, and then enable it for subscription plans. Peg it to a Euro token, and then create a proxy token out of that. We can't do all of this. I mean, I see a lot of these protocols that are largely and diverse, we can capture them as a token engineering characteristics. When we are designing that, we can just implement it and maybe we have extract all that value and still convey the characteristics uh, uh, across the spectrum. So uh, some of the things I, I found that were moving in that direction is uh, these standards. Uh, ERC, EIP 777, that's a way you create uh, authorities where you can spend tokens on your behalf. So there's really, uh, it's actually uh, one of the final stages actually. So this, you, we may see this happening uh, release, uh, in the next few months. Uh, paying transfers and tokens instead of gas. When we get that standard out, we, we, lead, we probably don't, we don't need ether for in the wallets of uh, users. Maybe we can do that abstraction as well. And lastly, uh, subscription tokens are huge, uh, enables things like streaming services and access-based economy instead of product-based economy. Payment channels also give you an ability to intercept between a user and the, uh, the payment interactions is a way to kind of create tra transaction fees in between. Uh, and this is a super important thing uh, in DevCon that's happening, Ethereum Magicians Council. There's a huge, uh, uh, there's a dedicated ring on business models and subscription tokens that I'm participating as well. But really all, all of this put together what we're moving towards, focus towards uh, how we see a protocol token should be. So uh, Chow is one of our first uh, token engineering NYC speakers and he says this perfectly, right? Uh, we, the last ICO boom was no doubt the uh, a byproduct of uh, ERC20 mechanism, right? Uh, and these, this is such a trivial thing that we've seen. It's, we, we can unlock so much, so many different things across uh, the Ethereum landscape, and uh, these things will happen in the future. And what would this unlock when we have B2B kind of tokens, when we can, uh, which we enable uh, uh, businesses to build on top and extract all this value? What would that unlock? Is the biggest, uh, is most excited thing that I'm looking forward to. So, uh, so finally, if you want to follow me, you can. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. Uh, Danke. See you at DevCon four, I guess. Thanks, Rahul. That was really inspiring. A lot of neurons firing in our brains. <laughs> I'm assuming. Um, it really reminded me like uh, how we used to go about uh, electronics engineering, where you have these electrons flowing, you convert them into voltages, currents frequencies mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of where you see these tokens relaying. Yeah. You have market makers, you have part of least resistance which is, are highly liquidity markets and etc. Um, but I just want to open the floor a bit for sure, uh, people yeah, yeah, here in the room. Uh, questions, let's start. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. My question is about, you mentioned in your presentation mainly Ethereum-based tokens. Mm -hmm. But what about, uh, let's say, Stellar platform and Stellar-based tokens yeah. uh, with transaction fees, fees, very low transaction fees, yeah. and interaction between uh, and private blockchains like Hyperledger and uh, monetization, let's say, Ethereum or Stellar or whatever. Thank you. So uh, I, I would say my, my, uh, my research and scope is pretty much focused on the Ethereum landscape and tokens. And also, I'm generally I have a different philosophy when it comes to uh, private and public blockchains. It's my reasoning between internet and internet kind of thing, and I actually don't even uh, I haven't even dived into private blockchains yet. So probably I won't be able to answer the question, but I, I can probably have a discussion and kind of like see if we can uh, uh, have a chat around that. Sorry about that. Though. An interesting protocol to look at is Interledger, which tries yeah. to bridge the gap between this with the uh, atomic swaps. Uh, any uh, here? Hi. Um, how do you abstract away the friction? Um, so there was a slide where you said that one of the challenges is abstracting away the friction of the token uh, for the network. And I think that most of these tokens actually add friction. And so how do you do that? Like, and can you yeah. define actually what yeah. does mean abstracting so, away? Sure. So uh, at, at the very nature of token is that it captures value, right? And it enables liquidity in form of economy or underlying asset representation or anything. But what, and the token also introduces a small amount of friction. The more amount, more tokens you have, the more friction you have in terms of user adoption and user experience. So the last, my last slide, actually, some of those EIP standards are focused on minimizing that friction or abstracting away that entire friction that you have as a taking on or using that token in general. So uh, for, for example, when you come in, you pay Ethereum gas costs that would require the friction of you having uh, Ethereum from a faucet or just buying yourself. But when you come into a, a DAP or your know, system, maybe you, the incentives are that if you signed up, you have 100 tokens. But there's no point when you signed up, you got 100 tokens to use a DAP, but you still need Ether to pay for your gas. And maybe one of the standards where you can pay gas in form of tokens is kind of like abstracting away uh, or removing that friction. So it kind of unlocks these things. So we are on that journey is where the first step is really acknowledging that there is friction and acknowledging that we need to uh, minimize these and acknowledging that we need more user adoption. Can I? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just trying to give a bit of diversity yeah, yeah. in the room. Um, think of a bill of token for these things, like a bot. Um, Anyone else? Questions? Uh, last question, maybe? Um. Um, you mentioned uh, ERC20 protocols. Um, I have a different model in my mind. Like For me, always like an ERC20 token usually is not a protocol. It's just a dApp token, even though, I mean, a lot of ICOs were selling ERC20 tokens, but they wanted to swap them to a protocol token. So. Um, for me, a protocol is, is like not linked to Ethereum or, or something. And but you pr presented was something else. Yeah, I, uh, the more time I spend on this, I actually see a little more uh, different. I think we see uh, like uh, things like ERC721 coming up, moving up the stack. And right now, the ERC20 that how we've been using is to really raise capital and transfer value. That's the only two uh, properties that we are uh, that we are actually leveraging. But I think when it comes to the DAP layer, we need more properties. Is that uh, we? Uh, I don't see ERC20 as a DAP token, but it's like if if you're in engineering, it's like you inherit some of those properties, so it'll be it'll always be at your core uh, architecture as your, of your core token design, but you add more characteristics as you figure out. For, for example, subscription tokens requires your token to be an uh, ERC-20 token for to unlock uh, uh, that subscription plans. So a lot of EIP proposals, if you actually start inspecting, it'll, it'll have a, a hierarchy of dependencies. So if you want to unlock, if you want to pass the standard, it actually requires EIP XYZ or EIP one two, three, or something like that. So uh, I, it's the more higher you go uh, above the stack towards the user, I think you will add a lot more token properties in general. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the question was why why it uh, why it doesn't and protocols have their own blockchain and protocols have their own token. So a lot of this is focused on the stack between 
the zero level blockchain, like the layer one solutions and uh, uh, the protocols built on top of those, which, which would mean they also inherit the token that was already existing, right? And then uh, it's between the DAP layer and, the, and that low level blockchain layer.